to you. Thank you. Okay, I will make a brief introduction for our uh, speaker. Hasan Taha is currently an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the University of California, Irvine. He received a PhD degree from the Engineering Mechanics Department at Virginia Tech, and simultaneously with a Master of Science degree in Mathematics. Uh, Dr. Taha's research interests spans geometric nonlinear control theory, unsteady aerodynamics, theoretical mechanics, and variational principles with applications to unconventional flight mechanics, such as bio-inspired flight. He's a recipient of an NFS, NSF Carrier Award, among several other awards. Taha, Dr. Taha is particularly interested in the history and philosophy of mechanics, and he has several lectures on the related topics. Okay, uh, Dr. Taha, we are with you. You have the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here and uh, give this seminar. I, uh, I mean, like I was telling you before the before the session starts, like Turkey has a special place in my heart. I always come and stop by and uh, hopefully maybe we can uh, do it in person sometime soon. So uh, today I will talk about um, two recent results that came out from our group. The first one is actually, let me see, I don't know. Yeah, the first one is about insect flight. So I uh, assume that you guys see my uh, screen well. So this is, uh, oops, no, all right. So this is a slow motion video for the hawk moth insect hovering over a flower. So basically insects, unlike birds, they move in a horizontal stroke plane, not in a vertical stroke plane, and they move very fast. This is a slow motion video. So uh, in fact, insect flight uh, has been a mystery for uh, scholars scientists, biologists for a century. So uh, when we write down the balance equation, the lift equal the weight, let me get my pointer here, must equal the weight. So we know the weight of the insect, we know the density of the air, rho, we know how fast the wing move, V, and we know how large the wing is, which is S. From Sorry. this equation, we, yeah, from this equation, we can get the required lift coefficient for balance. And then we can compare it to the maximum achievable lift coefficient using conventional aerodynamics. In this range, the ultra low Reynolds number where insects operate, the maximum achievable lift coefficient is quite small. So we, we found that the lift coefficient required for balance is about two to three times the maximum achievable lift coefficient using conventional aerodynamics. So we have like tens of papers that concluded by insect flight seem to be impossible using conventional aerodynamics and there must be unconventional lift mechanisms. It wasn't until very recently, two papers, one in, uh, in nature, one in science uh, by Ellington and his coworkers at Cambridge and Dickinson and his coworkers at Caltech and Berkeley they uh, discovered the main unconventional lift mechanism that insects exploit during flight, which is simply a leading edge vortex. And, you know, as, as, as you guys all know, after just uh, answering this simple question, how insects lift themselves, the immediate question is, how do they stabilize their flight? How do they achieve stable flight? And this is actually our question today, which... Uh, I'd like to shed some light on. So let's let's have some model at the beginning. So we have a model of the insect or the bird animal as a rigid body. So we have a rigid body in a, in a plane now, just a planar motion, simple things. So it has three degrees of freedom, forward speed u, normal speed w, pitching angle theta, pitching angular velocity q, x, z, and m are forces and moments. And if we neglect wing flexibility and wing inertia for the moment, we happily recover the exact same set of equations governing conventional airplanes. And we're happy because this set of equations has been studied over decades. So we have huge legacy to exploit. This is inertial and gravitational load, and this is aerodynamic loads. Oh, my, my. So, 
unlike conventional airplanes, you know, these aerodynamic loads are essentially time varying because we have seen in the video in the first slide that uh, the insect accelerates its wing and decelerates, changes the angle of attack throughout the cycle. So we have uh, essentially time varying aerodynamic loads. So if I to write my system in an abstract form, it will be written in this form. A uh, time invariant vector representing inertial and gravitational loads and the time varying vector field represents the aerodynamic loads. And now we're not happy anymore because this is a time varying system and time varying systems are difficult to, to deal with. For example, even for linear systems, everybody in this session knows by heart that if all the eigenvalues of the A matrix lie in the left half plane, the system is exponentially stable. But if it's A of T times X, if all the eigenvalues lie in the left half plane for all times, it doesn't guarantee stability. We have a counter example. So time varying systems are, are quite challenging. So when we look at our system, we represent this aerodynamic vector field or aerodynamic loads linear in the motion variables X. So, uh, and uh, so here is the representation. For, forget about all this details. Here's the take home message. You can notice now that we used two symbols, T and tau to denote the independent time variable. And this is to stress the fact that we do have two time scales, a fast time scale of the flapping motion and the associated aerodynamic loads and a slow time scale of the body motion. And to give you an idea about these two time scales, you as a human being with your bare human eye, you will be able to trace the motion of some insect from one point in the space to another. You can track its trajectory perfectly fine, but you will not be able to track the motion of their wings. They move their wings very fast. I'm talking about insects here, not birds. So definitely we have two time scales. And what about the ratio between these two time scales? For one of the slowest flapping insect, the hawk moth, the ratio between the flapping frequency omega f to the natural frequency of flight dynamics is about 30. So think about it. You have a body like this book, and I'm trying to excite this body with a varying force whose frequency is 30 times its natural frequency. It's too fast. So this is too fast. Most likely the body will not feel anything. It will only feel the average value of the aerodynamic force. So this naturally invokes averaging, which was originally adopted by biologists. They assume that the body only feels the average values of the aerodynamic loads. So now let's average over the fast time scale, the tau time scale. So we're going to integrate over tau and tau going to disappear. So there is no tau anymore, no explicit time dependence. The system now is time invariant, not time varying. But it's nonlinear, but it's, it's OK. I mean, we can always linearize and get a system matrix and check the eigenvalues. And you can see here is a complex conjugate pair in the right half plane indicating that the system is unstable. And there are like tens of papers concluded this. So it's it's kind of fact among flapping flight dynamics community that insects are unstable at hover. And everything made sense at the time. Why? Because if we look at the eigenvectors corresponding to this unstable eigenvalues, you will find that this instability is mainly due to pitching in this pitching motion. And why is that? Because we don't have pitch stiffness. There is no stiffness. There is no recovery mechanism. So what is the main source of pitch stiffness for a conventional airplane, an airplane like this, for example? Well, it's the horizontal tail. And uh, most insects do not have tails. And even if they do, the horizontal tail is not effective un unless you have a forward flight. At hovering, the horizontal tail cannot provide pitch stiffness. And this is why, this is the same reason why helicopters are also unstable at hover. So to an aeronautical engineer, an insect hovering over a flower is very similar to a helicopter hovering in place. And both systems are unstable for similar reasons. Everything made sense, except that we as engineers should have a mathematical justification of what we're doing. We should have a stability certificate. So if we go to the mathematical theory of time periodic systems, you will find the averaging theorem. So if F is periodic in time, then you can integrate over the cycle, which means that now you converted a time periodic system into a time invariant system. You got rid of time dependence, which is good. And more interestingly, if there was an 
a periodic orbit representing equilibrium here, now it reduces to a fixed point, an equilibrium point in this average dynamics. And of course, analyzing the stability of a fixed point for a time invariant system is much, much easier than analyzing the stability of a periodic orbit for time periodic system. And here is the mathematical statement of the theorem. For small enough epsilon, if this system is stable, that system is stable. Stability of the fixed point implies the stability of the periodic orbit. So you got to analyze the stability for an easy system and conclude the stability for a difficult system. That's a very powerful theorem that may seem to support the work of biologists. But it says for a small enough epsilon, what is this epsilon? Epsilon here goes by the reciprocal of the flapping frequency. So for high enough flapping frequency, epsilon ho hopefully is small enough for direct averaging to work, which is the main intuition behind averaging. High enough frequency means that uh, the system is doesn't feel the, the high frequency vibrations. So, but how small is small enough and how high is high enough? I didn't find a more rigorous uh, or a more expressive statement than this by Sanders and Verhelis. So they said, to many physicists and astronomers, averaging seems to be so natural that people do not even bother to justify the process. However, it is precisely the fact that averaging seems so natural that obscures the pitfalls and restrictions of the method. We need a more rigorous mathematical analysis tool that either supports or refutes the work of biologists. And when you, when you dig a bit more, you always find Russians behind the scene. So here is, uh, if you have, a system on this form. This paper actually was written by these two Russian mathematicians in the honor of the 70th birthday of the great Russian mathematician Pontryagin, the founder of optimal control theory. They developed a special calculus, uh, specially suited for time varying dynamical systems. It's called chronological calculus. And later on, Sarichev, another Russian mathematician, and Patricio Vela, uh, this was his PhD dissertation at Caltech. They used this new calculus to develop what they call complete averaging. So if you have a system on this form, it's complete average dynamics is not just integration over the cycle. It's actually an infinite series. The first term is the integral over the cycle. But the second term is the integral or the average of this bracket between F and its integral. And this bracket is just the Lie bracket. It's just the differentiation with respect to the states. So nothing fancy. So I can compute as many lambdas as I want analytically because it's just differentiation and integration. And here is the mathematical statement of the theorem. If this series converges and if this system is stable, then that system is also stable irrespective of epsilon. So you got to analyze stability for an easy system and conclude stability for a difficult system, irrespective of epsilon. There is no approximation here, and this is why they called it complete averaging. If epsilon is very small, so that epsilon squared is indeed negligible, and you can truncate after the first term, you will recover the direct averaging theorem. But if epsilon is not small enough, and you need to go higher and higher to capture the, the required accuracy. So uh, this is... Yeah, go ahead. Small epsilon means high enough frequency. Is that yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, flapping, right? Yes, yep, yep. So, so that's the point: is that the community thought that the ratio of of thirty is high enough, but it turns out that it's not, and we need to go higher and higher in accuracy. More terms in that series. So basically, we included only the second term, and here is what we got. So the red. The red cross is the eigenvalues using first order averaging for the hawk moth insect at hovering. The blue are for the second order averaging. And you can see that the, the system is basically stabilized. So on the average, the system was unstable, but these high frequency vibrations of zero mean, they have zero means, even though they have effect on the system, a, a stabilizing effect. The interesting part is that this analysis or this approach is analytical. So we can see what is really going on. For example, here is the system matrix for first order averaging for the Hawk moth. And here is the system matrix for second order averaging. We can compare term by term to see what's going on. Of particular importance is this term because it was zero. So it's solely created by these high frequency vibrations of zero mean. And let's try to interpret the meaning of this term. This is 
uh, the third row and fourth column. So this reads as follows. It reads as Q dot or theta double dot, the pitching acceleration due to a pitching angle. So if you multiply both sides by moment of inertia, you get a, a pitching moment due to pitching angle, a moment due to an angle or a force due to a displacement. That's a spring action. That is the stiffness that was lacked in the average dynamics. And that was the main reason behind the instability. So these high frequency vibrations give you for free a virtual spring effect. And that's not the first time to see a, a, a vibrationally induced spring. Here is the famous example of the inverted pendulum. It's an unstable system. If you leave it, it falls down. But if you vibrate it up and down, the upper equilibrium point becomes stable. And look at this. So we're going to give a disturbance. Look at how it resists disturbance and comes back to its equilibrium. It's exactly as if you have a torsional spring here. And if you use the same math, you will find that the average equation of motion look exactly the same as a mass spring system, where this virtual spring is related to the amplitude and frequency of vibrations. So it seems that the conclusion so far was, it seems that insects exploit the same phenomenon of vibrational stabilization to stabilize their uh, flight without feedback. So we said, okay, let's go to the lab and do this experiment. So here we have a, a, a robotic flapper, if you wanna say. So it's, it's one degree of freedom, it moves along an arc. And why we do it this way, because if we flap slowly, we will not generate enough lift and we will be here. If we flap strong enough, we will generate enough lift and we will be there. And we can, by controlling the frequency, we can uh, achieve whatever equilibrium we want. Why we want this? Because vibrational stabilization is only evident beyond a certain threshold of frequency. So we want to study the effect of frequency on the stability. And now the point is we're gonna change this fixation from uh, just a pure fix it to a, to a hinge, to allow pitching, because the pitching is the main source of instability. And now here is a, the two degree of freedom now moving along the arc in addition to pitching. We are flapping relatively slowly. So, and this is clear because we, we are down here. We're not generating enough lift. And as you can see, the system is crazy unstable. We have to stop it at some point, otherwise it will blow up. But if we increase the voltage to the motor, just increase the frequency, nothing more, no feedback, we will generate enough lift and we will be up there. The system is naturally stabilized. And if we push it, it comes back. And this is a very large push, by the way. It's 50 degrees disturbance. It's five zero. The system is very robust. Actually, I have this toy here. If you can see it, this is the toy. I always have it in my office. Any visitor comes, I let him or her play with it and push this toy and, and, and see it coming back. It's a very robust system. You push it all the way, it comes back. So that's interesting. It seems that uh, insects really exploit this phenomenon. So we, uh, as a last experiment, we called our biology expert, Professor Ty Hedrick at University of North Carolina. He already had this experiment, had a real, a real hawk moth hovering over a flower in his lab. And he had, high-speed video cameras all around to track the motion of the insect. And he does this. He shoots the moth <laughs> to disturb it in the air and tracks its recovery. And then it ge he gave us, uh, you know, everything, the body motion, the wing flapping motion. And now we can decompose the body motion into average contribution over bar and zero mean component within the cycle that is typically ignored uh, when we do averaging. And we pass this into our unsteady aerodynamic model to get an estimate of the recovery, recovering pitching moment. And here is the restoring moment uh, over the flapping cycles. So uh, negative means it's stable, it's recovering, opposing the motion. Positive means it's, it's unstable. So positive is bad, it's like COVID. Okay, so uh, as you can see, the, the blue is the contribution of average body motion. They are all positive, they are all destabilizing. So the average contributions are destabilizing, which confirms the, the community's results 
that when, when they do averaging, they find an unstable system. But look at the, the red ones. These are the vibrational ones of zero mean. And yet they are they all lead to a net stabilizing moment, and it's large enough to outweigh the instability comes from the average body motion. So the conclusion was insect flight indeed enjoys vibrational stabilization. We published this in Science Robotics, and uh, Science Robotics were generous enough to make a commentary on it from Matij at Delft. Also, the Journal of Experimental Biology wrote an article about it. Several people wrote an article about it. And I was lucky enough to get interviewed in one of the famous talk shows in the in Egypt, in the Middle East. But anyway, th this is this was just an icing on the cake. The, the real joy was in the discovery because look at this phenomenon. It's very interesting. Look at this. So the, the motion, this flapping motion, this back and forth flapping motion, this vibration, if you want to say, it's needed anyway, right? The insect gonna do it anyway. Why? Because it needs to generate lift, to, to generate lift force, right? To be in the air. So this very same motion gives you stability for free without feedback. So that's a, a remarkable design by nature, by the creator for, for this kind of, uh, of problem. All right, so I'm done with this first part and I will uh, switch gears to my second part, which is my, uh, I mean, I'm more excited about the second part. I think I'm, I'm running out of time actually. Um, all right, so, um, which is about a new theory of lift. It, it, it touches the heart of any aeronautical engineer or anyone who studied aerodynamics because it, 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 you know, it touches the most basic question in aerodynamics, how we compute lift on a two-dimensional airfoil. That, that's the most basic question. So I will start by, by this quote from Ken Chang, article in New York Times that, to those who fear flying, it's probably disconcerting that physicists and aeronautical engineers still passionately debate the fundamental issue underlying this endeavor. What keeps planes in the air? And yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's not, I'm not happy to report that the current theory of flight is quite fragile, <laughs> and I'll show you how. Well, here is an airfoil, and I want to compute lift over a two-dimensional airfoil. We always go back to the governing equations, like Maxwell equations in, in, in electromagnetism or you know Newton's equations of motion. So here is Euler's equation governing the dynamics of ideal fluids. If you give me any solution of Euler equation, I can always construct a special U1, a special velocity field, such that together with U0, is a solution of the Euler problem for any value of gamma. So uh, it's as if Euler equation cannot tell you anything about this gamma. And uh, so a solution with gamma equals one unit is as legitimate as a solution with gamma equals one million unit. Both satisfy the partial differential equation and boundary conditions. And what does this gamma represent? Well, it's the circulation over there for. And ironically, it's the sole dictator of the lift force. Lift is simply rho u gamma, is the density of the air, speed of the flight, and gamma. Give me gamma, I immediately give you the lift force. So it's ironically, the Euler equation cannot tell you anything about one of the most fundamental quantities in flight, the lift force. So uh, the question has always been, what, what solution does nature select among this infinitely many solutions, possible solutions of Euler equation? Here is a solution, for example, with relatively small gamma. So the flow rotates around this sharp edge from the lower surface to the upper surface. And we get small lift because gamma is small. And here is another solution with large gamma. So the flow rotates the other way around from the upper surface to the lower surface around the edge, and we get large lift. So uh, in these two scenarios, you can see that there is very large acceleration, actually infinite, infinite acceleration, infinite curvature around the sharp edge because the flow is rotating around a sharp edge. It's like a zero turning in a zero radius of curvature kind of thing. So really we need, we need, we need to know which what solution does nature provide? And here comes the role of the Kutta and Joukowsky, what we call the Kutta condition. 
they say, okay, this doesn't happen in reality. This singularity doesn't happen in reality. The flow here goes, speed goes to infinity. This doesn't happen in reality. Nature selects this flow where there is no flow around the edge from the lower surface to the upper surface or vice versa. The flow is smooth at the trailing edge. The corresponding circulation should be the right circulation. The corresponding lift should be the right lift that nature provides. This is indeed correct because if you look at Prandtl flow visualization 1904, indeed the flow goes smoothly off the trailing edge. So that's a brilliant condition. So, and it enabled aviation. This is the dominant theory that we teach in every single aeronautical engineering school. Fine. But the question that our undergraduate students do not ask when we teach this, luckily, is the following. What happens if we don't have a sharp edge? So we don't have a singularity to remove. The flow is smooth everywhere for all values of gammas. All values of gammas are perfectly legitimate. Well, the entire theory, the dominant theory that we teach in every single aeronautical engineering school immediately collapses. There is no theoretical model that can predict lift over smooth and nice shape like this. And what, what about if we have multiple sharp edges? So one value of gamma will make the flow smooth here, but not there, and vice versa. Which one should you pick? The ambiguity remains. Not only that, what about unsteady flows, a fast maneuver like those in the Top Gun movie? So Martin Kotta never claimed that his condition applies to unsteady flows, and indeed it does it. Here is Prandtl flow visualization in the exact same catalog of picture. Here is an impulsive start, a fast maneuver. The flow indeed goes around edge, unlike the steady case. And here is tens of papers in the literature criticizing the application of Kotta condition to unsteady flows. So yet the entire theory of unsteady aerodynamics is starting from the pioneering work of Wagner, Tudorson, von Karman, Sears, all the way to the most recent work in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. They all adopted the Kutta condition in their unsteady models because simply there are no alternatives. So we, we kind of stuck. We have a, a very fragile theory of left. Uh, that is applicable in a very, very special case. And if anything changes, the theory immediately collapses. Why are we stuck into this? Because the issue is deeply rooted in the governing equation itself, in the first principle itself. Our last shield is already broken. And people, this led to the following. If Euler equation cannot tell you anything about the lift, but when we solve Navier-Stokes equation, when we add this vis viscous term, then we get lift. It seems from this picture that lift is a viscous phenomenon, is due to viscosity. And it means that when we feed the Euler equation with the Kutta-like condition, we get a similar lift to Navier-Stokes. It means that the Kutta condition is a viscous condition. This is the conventional wisdom in the community. Pick your favorite book in aerodynamics. Here is Anderson, uh, sixth edition, section 4.5.1. Nature enforces the Kutta condition by means of friction. Professor Ackroyd of Manchester, we fly therefore courtesy of the air's very small viscosity. So this is really, you know, the community's uh, conventional wisdom. This is what the community believe. And this is deeply rooted in D'Alembert's paradox. So D'Alembert solved the Euler equation for somebody and over somebody and obtained this perfectly symmetric solution for aft up and down so the pressure forces cancel each other leading to a zero force this is what we know what is known as the d'alembert paradox so deep down in the in the background of every physicist and the fluid mechanician ideal fluids are forceless they don't produce forces they cannot lift airplanes so one, one thing that I need to stress before leaving this slide is that at that time of D'Alembert, we did not know that Euler equation has infinitely many solutions. And the zero D'Alembert's zero force solution is only one out of only one out of these infinitely many solutions. And we don't know with what solution does nature select every time. Is it D'Alembert's zero force solution or, or what? All right. I'm gonna skip this part because I, I'm, I'm running out of time and I will, so that's the background. This is the background that I, I told you, right? And uh, let me tell you our version of the story. Uh, and I'm gonna skip this part. 
So here is our version of the story. And instead of giving you the final result, I will walk you through our evolution of uh, line of thought. This is what we're supposed to, to solve. Navier-Stokes equation, which is nothing but force equal mass times acceleration, the dynamics, subject to continuity constraint, which is just a kinematic constraint on the velocity field. This is what we need to solve. But instead, this is what we actually solve. We solve the Laplacian and the velocity potential. And this equation is composed of two equations, the continuity equation and the irrotationality assumption. These two equations are pure kinematic constraints on the velocity field U. There is no dynamics. There is no force equal mass times acceleration. So the potential flow is purely kinematical, no dynamical considerations. And one might expect that this purely kinematical analysis is not sufficient, and we need a closure condition. We need a, a Kutta-like condition. But this means that if we are, if we want to develop a true closure condition from first principles, it must come from dynamical considerations. It must come from something like force equal mass times acceleration kind of argument. But how to project the dynamics of Navier-Stokes or even Euler on a one-dimensional manifold to focus on the dynamics of circulation alone? That's so challenging of a task. Here, I'm going to remind you of the, the way we do dynamics is one of two ways, either Newton's way or Lagrangian way. And here is an example. If I have 100 particles in three dimensions, but they are rigidly connected such that we just have only three degrees of freedom. So uh, if I want to solve this using Newton's equation, well, I need to isolate each particle from the surrounding, draw the free body diagram, and write down the equation of motion for each particle. So that's 100 equation of motion. So in 3D, it will be 300 equations of motion. Even though I have only three degrees of freedom, I still need to write down 300 equations of motion. So that's the Newtonian way. So for, a, for a, an infinite number of particles in a fluid continuum, this results in a partial differential equation, right? Whether it's Euler or Navier-Stokes. On the other hand, I have a nice story about Feynman, but I mean, due to the time constraint, I will, I will, I will skip it for, for the time. On the other hand, the main premise is that nature minimizes a certain fundamental quantity in every single motion. So a tree leaf falling down to the ground or an orbit, you know, a, a planet orbiting the sun, a heart is bumping. They all move such that a certain fundamental quantity is minimum. So if you manage to write down your fundamental quantity in terms of your degrees of freedom, then you can directly get your equations of motion, the three relevant equations of motion, without the need to solve 300 equations of motion. So this branch seems to be very well suited for our problem. Why? Because if the classical theory provides me with the velocity field everywhere, except for one unknown parameter, gamma, if I write down my magic quantity with respect to gamma, I just differentiate with respect to gamma and equate to zero, I'm done. I get one equation in one unknown, and I'm done. So, well, what is the magic quantity that nature minimizes? Well, it's the kinetic energy. That's the principle of least action. And if we try to minimize this with respect to gamma, we get zero lift. So that was shocking to us. So it's a non-trivial question to ask. What is the magic quantity that nature minimizes in every airfoil problem? And here comes the role of a principle that is less well-known, much less well-known, is rarely found in textbooks of classical physics and analytical mechanics. It's Gauss' principle of least constraint. So if you have a collection of particles, and here is the equation of motion uh, for each particle. Now I need to, uh, you know, in analytical mechanics, we always decompose forces into two categories. There is applied forces, external applied forces kind of thing, and constrained forces. What are these constrained forces? Constrained forces are, are there in life. They exist only to ensure some constraint. For example, here is the pendulum. The mass of the pendulum is constrained to move along a circle. So there must be a force whose only role in life or main role in life is to ensure this constraint. Basically, this is the force in the rod. So the force in the rod here is classified as a constraint force. The same, for example, if we have a mass rolling on a plane, right, on an inclined plane. So the normal force is responsible for that constraint. Fine. If this is, 
If this is the case, then Gauss principle asserts the following. The following quantity must be minimum at every instant. And it has a beautiful meaning. What is, what is that? Well, F is the applied force. So divided by mass is the applied acceleration. You can say the desired acceleration. A is the actual acceleration. In the absence of constraints, they are exactly the same. The actual motion will follow the desired motion. But in the presence of constraints, they will deviate. However, Gauss principle asserts that the actual motion will deviate from the desired motion only by the amount that satisfies the constraint. Nature will not overdo it. So this quantity must be minimum at every instant. And it has another meaning, actually. When you, when you look at this difference uh, from the equation of motion, it's nothing but R over M. So it's as if we're minimizing the summation of all constraint forces squared, hence the name least constraint. And here is, uh, I mean, probably I have some time to say this. So, um, so actually look at this name, actually the, the name of R. R, is, is, R looks like a residual between the applied motion and the actual motion. So it's as if we're minimizing the residual square. It's, it's kind of least squares kind of approach. So inspired by his method of least squares, Gauss proposed this fundamental principle. This is his words. It is quite remarkable that nature modifies free motions incompatible with the necessary constraints in the same way in which the calculating mathematician uses least squares. Like I said, Gauss principle is rarely found in textbooks of classical physics. Actually, Papa Stavridis wrote that in most of the 20th century English literature, Gauss principle has been barely tolerated as a clever but essentially useless academic curiosity when it was mentioned at all. By the way, I, I was intrigued when I found that there are only 10 names between Gauss and myself. I could track my lineage all the way to Gauss only through 10 names in, in that website of math genealogy. So that was fun to me when I am solely relying on Gauss principle now. So anyway, uh, I'm actually not relying on Gauss principle. I'm relying on a special case of Gauss principle. If there are no forces, if there are no forces, so my equation of motion is like this. We have only constrained forces. In this case, Gauss quantity, which is acceleration minus force over mass, becomes just acceleration squared, weighted by the mass. And this quantity is actually has a name. It's called the apillion. Uh, and uh, you can easily show that in, in this case, minimization of acceleration squared is equivalent to minimization of normal acceleration squared. And when you minimize normal acceleration, it's as if you're minimizing curvature. So a special case of Gauss principle is Hertz principle of least curvature. And this has its own simple meaning. Let me give you this in a, in a, in a 30 second or something. So when you have a free particle, it moves along a straight line. Yeah, that, that's well known, fine. Now, if it's constrained, it will deviate from a straight line to satisfy the constraint. Yes, but it will only deviate only by the amount that satisfies the constraint. Nature will not overdo it. So the deviation from a straight line is minimum, and the deviation from a straight line is curvature, hence the name least curvature. And that's the principle that we're using, which is a special case of Gauss. So now go back to Euler equation that has been waiting for us. So we need to acceleration in the left-hand side equal forces in the right-hand side. We need to classify the pressure force, whether it's applied force, so we apply Gauss, or it's a constrained force. So in this case, we will not have any applied force. We apply Hertz principle. Interestingly, it's the latter. For incompressible fluids, pressure force is a constrained force. You can easily show that if you have a velocity field that already satisfies continuity and this boundary condition, the pressure force doesn't do any work on it. So the pressure force, its only role, its main role in, in incompressible flow is to ensure this constraint of, of continuity. And this comes from a, a, a geometric picture of the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition. I'm happy to talk about it later, but, uh, but I mean, the main conclusion is that pressure force is a constrained force. So for an ideal fluid, we have the right-hand side, no applied forces. So it's as if the ideal fluid is free subject to continuity. So we simply apply Gauss principle. Here is our equation of motion. Here is my acceleration. And I'm going to apply Hertz principle. 
So, which is simply saying that the acceleration squared is minimum, right? That's that's Hertz principle. So this is my cost function that I need to minimize. This is the cost that nature minimizes in every time instant. And you can say that this is a new principle in fluid physics. And instead of solving Euler equation, if you have an ideal fluid problem, I can go and solve Euler partial differential equation. Alternatively, you can go and simply minimize your acceleration square. That's equivalent. And we have a theorem that proves this equivalence. All right, so now we're, we're ready. We're ready because the classical theory gives me the velocity everywhere except for one unknown parameter. This is my only missing parameter, gamma, which controls the lift. Fine, I'm going to form my host function, which is the acceleration squared. Here is my acceleration. In steady steady state, there is no partial partial t. So I have only this term, which is what we call the convective acceleration. And when we integrate over the space, this quantity is only a quantity, a function of gamma. So if we consider and are just a regular airfoil with a sharp trailing edge. And we plot this quantity, the apillion or the acceleration square versus gamma at different angles of attack. At each angle of attack, there is a unique gamma that minimizes this quantity. And these, minimizes, these minimizing gammas, they coincide with Kutta's values. So we happily recover the Kutta condition in this special case of a sharp edge airfoil. But this theory, unlike the Kutta's, is derived from first principles. So it doesn't care whether we have a sharp edge or not. So we can, for the first time, consider this spectrum of shapes. This is my last slide. I have a spectrum of shapes, parameterize this parameter D. D equals zero represents this blue sharp edge airfoil. D equal one is the green circular cylinder. In between, I have a spectrum of smooth shapes with uh, no sharp edge. And here is the contour of the apillion, the, the curvature, the acceleration square in the gamma D space. The yellow curve is the minimizing gamma, gamma star, normalized by gamma kutta. So for D equal one, this is a circular cylinder, we recover the well-known fact that gamma star is zero, that no, no lift over a circular cylinder in an ideal fluid. But as D equal, D equal zero, so we have a sharp edge there for it, our gamma star converges to gamma kutta. So we recover the kutta condition as a special case, which means that this theory is invested. It doesn't have any viscosity. It means that the kutta condition is not a viscous condition. So it corrects this accepted wisdom in, in the community. All right, so conclusions. Insect flight indeed enjoys vibrational stabilization. The apillion or the acceleration squared is the quantity that nature minimizes in every nice and attached airfoil problem. We developed a variational theory of aerodynamics that generalized the century-old Kutta theory. Unlike Kutta's theory, this is derived from first principles. It's applicable for any shape not confined to airfoils with sharp edges. And it implies that the Kutta condition itself cannot be a viscous condition. It's just a momentum conservation condition. And I'd like to thank my group and the funding from NSF and the Air Force. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Taha. Thank you for this interesting and engaging presentation. I guess we can have now the questions and comments if you have any. You may raise your hand. If you don't have the microphone, I may help you to We have thanks from audiences. Yes, I mean, Hojam, thank you. Uh, 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 do we have it? Uh, I think I've got a uh, question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I am lucky that uh, I uh, uh, followed this talk, very similar talk, uh, live uh, in Pakistan <laughs> at, at yes. a conference. We were both uh, invited speakers at that conference last summer. It was a beautiful place and nice conference. And uh, I had the honor of uh, meeting uh, uh, Sam over there. And then he came uh, to Turkey, in fact. He's got yes. good relations with uh, uh, several institutions in Turkey, I can say. And I'm hoping that uh, we will host him uh, maybe next summer uh, at our university in our premises as well. 
thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a simple uh, comment. Can we, because this is a kind of nature's uh, uh, control uh, yes. and stabilization issue. And I think uh, the uh, Lyapunov approach is also explaining this, that uh, uh, energy pr pr uh, pr principle, because uh, it sort of goes to uh, uh, approaches to zero, uh, let's say, and uh, stabilizes the system. Maybe we can uh, make use of that approach as well, uh, like the uh, Gaussian uh, one. What would you say? That's a, that's a very interesting uh point of view i actually uh, didn't think of it this way before but it's 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 very interesting if one can uh, formulate this do you, do you talk, are you talking about the the vibrational stabilization one yes or, or yes, the, yes, yeah. yes if the first talk yes so after. yes i think i think there there uh, one can use the one can use the lyapunov theory the time varying version of it Perhaps the, the challenge will be uh, to find the uh, Lyapunov function itself. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like it's possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least, I mean, we, we can try it at least for the linear case. The nonlinearity is not adding much to us, but at least we can try it in the linear case. And I think it should, we, we should be able to, that, that would be natural. That would be interesting because like you said, it's a mechanical system. It has some energy. At the end of the day, it will need to minimize the energy. So we should be able to find an energy function that is uh, continuously decreasing along the trajectories. I, I never tried it this way, but it's it's a very interesting insight. Thank you, Sharif. Thank maybe you. we can we can talk on this later on, and maybe sure. maybe start something, uh, you know, a, a kind of joint work. On yeah, this. exactly. <laughs> that, that would be that would be great. That would be really great. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif Ajam. Is are there any questions and comments? Uh, I also would like to ask something about this vibrational stabilization. About your, uh, uh, I'm referring to the first part of the talk, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about your uh, experimental setup in the laboratory. There's sure. this like a pendulum like one mm -hmm. dimension mm -hmm. motion, and then yes. you create this artificial flap, right? Yes. And as you increase the angle and uh, for ch changing the angle, I mean, the uh, flapping frequency was the same or not? Changing the angle, actually, we, we don't change that... the, we, we change the frequency, we increase the frequency. Flapping frequency. No, no, you add some uh, other angle for the motion, left oh, and right. Oh, 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 I see, I see, it's I see. It's not one dimensional angular motion. You yes, also exactly. add to it you were not using the half moth right it's the just a flapping but it yes. was more stabilized for the larger angles i thought it was the me, same same me. frequency but if you have the larger angle it is more stabilized is did i get it wrong let me let me i think you, you mean here right so this is this is one right yeah yeah so this uh, is not Stable. This, is the this is the unstable one, but it's unstable because the frequency is is relatively small. If you increase uh -huh. the frequency, now, now if you increase the frequency, it will have higher lift, so it will lift itself up to a, a different equilibrium, uh, right? Okay. And and yes. and at this high frequency, I thought, I thought for the same frequency, if you increase the lift, I thought so. Okay, I I, I understood. <laughs> Yeah, so so th there is a, yeah, it's the problem is highly coupled. Once you increase the frequency, of course, the lift will increase, and and yeah. that's the, that's the main point. So it's highly coupled. It, it's it's difficult to isolate conclusions, but on the other hand, it 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 makes you appreciate uh, the nature design because highly coupled it means that that this high frequency is is needed anyway to generate the lift. And uh, this high frequency, by the way, as a byproduct, gives you stability. So the high frequency gives you two things, the required lift and the required stability, because also at low frequency, you will, you will not get enough lift. And at low frequency, you will it will happen like here. It will be unstable at low frequency. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.
and also for the trajectory of the insect and then the flap the time scale which we cannot uh, trace with our naked eye so the higher the ratio it's better and the stable the system i guess right the higher the flap rate that's interesting so the higher the ratio means that the more accurate the averaging the averaging Mm, the, mm. the more accurate the averaging results yeah say it again so higher ratio gives you accurate results yes the higher the ratio the more accurate the just the averaging results uh, Ac if it's what do we mean here because i'm not into that field exact i'm a high energy physicist by the way i'm just trying ah, to understand. okay so the <laughs> accurate results means more stable moving object i uh, know i would say i just uh, want to okay. yeah that, that's that's I, a... I would i would say uh, accuracy of positioning am i right uh, okay i would but i would of course yeah that, that's that's right so oh this is a very good point so uh, uh let me okay H higher ratio means means that the 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 amplitude of oscillations around the mean or the variations around the mean is is very small you know, so, really, really so, 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 um, when you have an insect hovering over a flower, it's not really stationary in the space. It's 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 doing oscillations yeah, in yeah, all directions. Yes. So, and the higher the frequency, the higher this ratio, uh, these oscillations are negligible and negligible. So, if you zoom out and you look from a distance, it's as if it's stationary. Onur Madandere, I guess he has no microphone set up. He says, is that the whole insect vibrating <laughs> or just the wings? I guess the, the insect vibration we call is the unstabilized um, insect. So that's a very good question. So the source of vibration comes from the wings because the wing will slip back and forth, but, but they are attached to the body. Too. So these inertial loads and aerodynamic loads are transferred to the body. So the body as a whole also oscillates back and forth. Because <clears throat> of the center of mass, maybe? Yes, exactly. And actually, you can kind of see this here. Uh, why it stopped? Yeah. So, so even probably, yes, if you look here, maybe at, let's look, yeah. You will find that this rod, it oscillates a little bit. And also this rod, they oscillate a little bit. They cannot be stationary in space because the wings are vibrating. So they're gonna shake uh, the surrounding structure. So if the wings move, the body part, the, 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 the main body of the insect will move up and down, not yes. maybe with the same frequency, just to keep the center of mass in the same position maybe to keep yes yes it, it, exactly exactly yes for conservation of momentum yeah i mean it has to it has to move okay amazing. thank you amazing it's really interesting any more questions and comments uh maybe we should try to build uh, drones you know imitating this motion this yeah, way yeah that's actually that's uh let me uh let me actually i can show you <laughs> we, we we build something here let me, let me especially for it. hovering purpose you know they are uh, we, we may do, do you see this advantages. do you see this sharif uh -huh. yeah we, yes. we 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 brought four of these flapping machines and we put them together in a quad fashion and as you can see it's quite actually controllable uh we can control it and we hover in place and yeah and uh, <laughs> here is another video for it. It will it will do a somersault. It's very maneuverable, actually, in comparison to a usual quadcopter that we buy off the shelf. This one. I don't know if you see. It. Yeah. I I I meant this video, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The one on the uh, top. This left. is this is the this is the drone that we built. We call it the quad flapper. Quad flapper. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we should try something like that, yes.
<laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Yes, thank you. I guess everything is clear and explained by our speaker. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> things things yeah. are not so easy, you know, to, to yeah, be that I, clear. <laughs> I would like to thank, if we don't have any more questions and comments, I would like to thank to our speaker, Dr. Heysem Taha. Thank you for your time early in this morning of, from California. Thank you. And I would like to thank our audience. Uh, and I hope to see them uh, for the next week grad talk. Thank you. Good evening to our speakers. And thank you again, Dr. Heysem. Thank you. Thank you, Mura. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sharif. Looking thank forward you. Yes, to yes. hopefully yes. see you in two weeks. Hopefully, you. yes, it's, see you. Yeah. We'd thank love you. to see you. Yes. Face. Grad thank talk you. in other seminar. <laughs> thank you. Very Bye bye. Good evening. Merhabalar hocam. Sesim geliyor mu acaba? Hicran. Evet, evet geliyor. Hocam Anladım. aslında ben bir soru sormak istiyorum ama kısaca yani biraz uçuşla ilgili bir soru 